Without question, the biggest political scandal Britain has ever faced will be exposed tonight. It involves a secret network of the highest office holders in the land, past and current members of parliament, cabinet ministers, judges, diplomats, even one of the country's top spies. These men are accused of some of the most sadistic child sexual abuse imaginable on hundreds of victims, some as young as eight. More confronting still are claims that children were killed in order to protect this network of predators, including one boy whose father worked at the Australian High Commission in London. For over 40 years, the evil child predators acted with complete impunity, hiding behind the facade of respectability. But no longer. They were children, often the most vulnerable, placed in the care of the state only to be betrayed, systematically trafficked to the most powerful men in the land. How many times were you raped? Wow, uh, maybe twice, three times a week. Boys and girls both farmed out to pedophiles like throwaway toys. There would be a group of a group of girls and a group of men. And the men would, would basically single out the girls. Tonight, three victims speak out. Claims of a monumental cover-up. That children were murdered. One of them, the 15-year-old son of the Australian High Commissioner's chauffeur. I just said to him that I think he's been taken by someone high up. And what did that senior policeman say to you? He said to me, you keep saying things like that, you could get hurt. And the secret pedophile brotherhood who to this day demand their right to have sex with children. What constitutes consent? The willing involvement of a child. It's really quite simple. A sex scandal at the very highest levels of the British establishment. Child sexual abuse victims come forward to point the finger at very powerful men. Serving members of the British Parliament, cabinet ministers, lords, spies, even senior police. Incriminated in a VIP pedophile ring for the privileged and powerful. It happened to me, it happened to others, and why would it go on for so long? Why didn't somebody just step in and say, we need to investigate this? Richard Kerr is now 54 and a clearly damaged man. His life began to fall apart when at the age of nine, he was sent to the now infamous Kinkora Boys Home in Northern Ireland run by men who would later be convicted of the frequent rape of children in their care. How soon did the abuse start when you were sent there? Well, a week later, maybe. Within a few years, Richard and other boys from the home were being trafficked around the country. You were brought across essentially to be playthings for pedophiles. In Boy toys. I felt afraid to say no. Uh, as long as I perform well, they said they'd take care of me. So when you first came to London, Richard, what was the first place you were brought to? Um, the first place? I was taken to um, Dolphin Square. Today, Richard Kerr is bringing us back to the place where he was taken to meet the men who ruled the country. 
an upmarket apartment complex called Dolphin Square, just minutes from the Houses of Parliament. What happened in here, Richard? What happened in here, I was taken in here, I was told to sit down on the bed, and he started to take my clothes off. It still hurts, doesn't it? Of course it hurts. I've never forget, uh, it, it hurts. Richard was brought here to have sex with politicians and other high-ranking members of the British establishment, including members of the House of Lords. Are any of them still in the Parliament? Um, yeah. Older, very old, lords. <laughs> Richard was one of dozens of boys and girls, almost all from state institutions, brought to the homes of the rich and powerful to be forced into sex with adults. My soul at that time was being destroyed. And they took away everything I had, everything I had. British police are now investigating compelling evidence that dozens of children suffered similar fates. I am Mr Baker. I am age 11. The happy smile hides a terrible secret. When this video was taken of 11-year-old Esther Baker, she had already been sexually abused for years. At the age of six, a family member took you to other pedophiles, didn't they? Yes. There would be a group of girls and a group of men, and the men would, would basically single out the girls, pick who they wanted, and then we'd, we'd be abused. Raped? Yeah. Um, they did um, anything from from molestation, which is which is touching and um, an oral sex to to full penetrative sex. Esther, now thirty-two, has identified two British politicians who were among her abusers in the early nineteen nineties. The man I'm going to show you the photograph of is a lord, a very senior politician. Have a look at this photograph and tell me if you recognise this person. Yeah. Yeah. So you're absolutely clear that this is the man that sexually abused you? Yeah. Over how many years? Over, um, over about five, six years. And him? Yeah. So the photograph I'm showing you now is a, a person who until very recently, in fact the last election, was a fairly senior member of a political party in the House of Commons. Yeah. You're saying that that man abused you? Yeah. How can you be so sure? A lot of people might be watching this and thinking, well, she was a little girl. Maybe she's confused. Maybe she genuinely believes what she's saying, but she's confused. What, what do you say to that? I'd say you don't forget those faces. No way. They were powerful people. They were also people who uh, very obviously had formed a group and enjoyed having sex with young children. This man, we'll call Darren, was 15 and in a care home when he met Peter Wrighton, a senior advisor to the government on child development and secretly a member of the Pedophile Information Exchange, 
a group campaigning to lower the age of consent for child sex. In this home video, Wrighton can be seen grooming teenage boys, encouraging them to drink alcohol and engage in sexually suggestive behaviour. Wrighton would supply boys like Darren to VIPs at Dolphin Square. He would be basically told who to go and talk to and what to do and which, with which person. One of those men, also named by other witnesses we've spoken to, was Leon Britton, the former British Home Secretary. One of the most powerful men in the land, Leon Britton should have been prosecuting pedophiles. Instead, according to Darren and other witnesses, he was one of them. He liked boys to dress in women's underwear and then to be in a room alone and discover you in women's underwear and punish you for wearing the underwear. A member of Margaret Thatcher's cabinet? Yes. Raping children? Yes. Their stories may sound unbelievable, but their accounts of the abuse they suffered are being taken very seriously by British police and by a new generation of political leaders. I think there has to be an element of cover-up or conspiracy, call it what you want. Men like Conservative MP Zach Goldsmith. If it's true, and the evidence suggests that it is, yeah. this is, isn't it, the biggest political scandal in British history? I think that's right. I think there was very compelling evidence that very senior people engaged in terrible acts and were then protected by the establishment. I have no doubt at all about that, but I think the genie is out of the bottle. Coming up, from abuse to murder. He sees Martin being led onto a train by a tall blonde man in his 30s. The link to Australia's High Commissioner. With the number plate Oz1. As the conspiracy deepens. What did that senior policeman say to you? He said to me, you keep saying things like that, you could get hurt. That's next on 60 Minutes. As we've uncovered tonight, the evil network of pedophiles included some of the most powerful and smartest minds in Britain. For years, they acted without fear of being caught, which was probably because one of their members was the second in charge of Britain's secret service. But the origins of their nefarious activities go back to a group called the Pedophile Information Exchange, or PI which in the early 1970s openly campaigned for the age of sexual consent to be lowered to four. Now be warned, you're about to meet a member of that group who unbelievably continues to say pedophilia is acceptable. Tell us what PI was all about, the Pedophile Information Exchange. PI was an organisation uh, for people who had a sexual attraction uh, to children. And we thought our illegal um, interest in children ought to be made legal if uh, it concerned relations with uh, young people who were consenting to a relationship, if they were willingly involved. Tom O'Carroll is a self-confessed, unrepentant pedophile and one of the founding members of the Pedophile Information Exchange. He now shies away from advocating the age of four. Too easily misunderstood, he says. Uh, the age of four came into it insofar as children by that age are normally verbal and can normally say whether they are uh, liking a particular kind of activity or not. You believe and advocate that it should be OK for an adult to have consenting sexual relations with a child aged 10, so long as it doesn't involve penetrative sex? Well, the emphasis here is on, the, on consenting, the willing, free, um, uncoerced um, involvement of the child, yes. And can I ask you this, though? Do you believe still that the majority of children at the age of 10 can communicate their consent to a sexual act? Yes, I do, yes. 
Um, so, so I, I, I don't see that that is a problem, communicating their consent. What constitutes consent? The willing involvement of a child. It's really quite simple. But how does one judge that? That is a matter, of, as it is with adult consent, for the people involved. Tom O'Carroll's self-serving views are a chilling insight into the mindset of the pedophiles who achieved positions of great power in British society. O'Carroll and four other members of Pi were prosecuted and jailed in 1981, but a sixth member of the group was identified at the time only as Peter Henderson. He escaped prosecution. OK, I've got another photograph to show you. Mm -hmm. Do you know this man? I know this man. Who was he? This Peter Hayme. Did he have sex with you? Yes, we had oral, but well, yes. The pedophile who called himself Peter Henderson was in fact Sir Peter Telford Heyman, deputy head of the British Secret Service, MI6, one of the most powerful men in Britain. Heyman was caught with diaries full of sadistic sexual fantasies about children. But the spy chief was allowed to walk free. He's the one who carried the brown book. What, what was the brown book? Like a brown diary. He put notes in it. What, so he kept notes about what he'd done to you? Maybe what I say. He had a brown dark book. He carried it in his pocket. For decades, powerful men like Heyman were allowed to get away with their crimes. But even today, Tom O'Carroll argues he and other pedophiles should be allowed to have sex with children. You I... keep saying, by the way, it's sex with children. It's not sex with children. It's sex, most people think, is sexual intercourse, penis in vagina, and um, a, a guy banging away until he gets orgasm. That's not what I mean by sex with children. What are you talking and about? And I don't, I, don't I don't think we should talk in this sort of um, emotive fashion about okay, sex well, with children. What is a less emotive term? Erotic contact with children. And what would that involve? Well, it might involve a, a t a touching or a masturbation. In the warped view of the pedophile information exchange, the only harm caused by an adult having sex with a child occurs later, when the child is supposedly made to feel guilty about it. If they were traumatised, they wouldn't have gone along. You see, that, that's another lie that pedophiles spin. They, tell, they, they say that the kids aren't traumatised. No, 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 me, I, I, no, wait, wait a moment. Believe me, they are traumatised, uh, Tom. Yes, but many years later, as a result well, of being told... Uh, why well, It matters because they would not have been traumatised but for being told that they had been abused. So this is the point. You'd say that it's not the paedophile that's caused the abuse, it's the responsible authorities like the police yes, and their parents. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So you don't accept that having sex with a child can cause any kind of... Well, let me tell you, we're getting peculiarly hysterical. Many years later, when people are told that they have been abused and it keeps being rammed into them from the media all the time, then that is the feeling they, become to, they come to get. They, think, they come to think, I must be traumatised because people keep telling me so. Okay, That's well, how it happens. Can I put to you, there's something in your book. Mm -hmm. There's a section in your book where you describe the scenario of a little girl sitting on a man's knee. Yes. And he, you, describe approvingly how sexual relations with that little girl can be, quote, negotiated mm -hmm. by hints yeah. and signals, mm -hmm. such as complimenting her on her knickers yeah. Yeah. and testing her response. Yeah. And what would be the adequate response from that little girl, Tom? Enthusiasm. What would that constitute? How would the little girl show you enthusiasm for you wanting to have sex with her? 
Let's move away from... No, no, no. Let's from, stick to this issue. Well, all right. Let, let's let's, so let's give, stick with the me, issue, but let me, addre give, let me address it in my okay. own way. The little girl sitting on your knee, and you've just told her, I like your knickers. Let me address what, what it in my own way. What does that little girl do to indicate that she's willing to consent to have sex with you, Tom? How does somebody indicate willingness to have consent to anything? A little girl cannot possibly be a consenting partner in that kind of power relationship. She's sitting on your knee, for God's sake. Yes, she can. You're an adult. Yes, she can. You use the term enthusiasm. What does that little girl do to indicate that she's enthusiastic? I, 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 think, I think that we're going round and round in circles. No, what, what is the answer? We're, we're going round and round in circles. I've given you my answer multiple times, so I'll, I'll, I'll finish there. Which is okay. a non-answer. You just can't answer. Well, you think it's a non-answer. I think it's an answer. All right. <laughs> Disgraceful secrets are only now coming to light. Men occupying some of the highest positions in the land whose depraved crimes have scarred a generation of children. But for the victims of this scandal, for those who have lived their lives in pain, there is no walking away from this fight. You realise it's going to boil down to the word of a woman 20 years on, remembering what happened to her when she was between the ages of 6 to 11 years old. Yeah. They're really going to go your credibility, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I'm ready for that because I've I've been very open about about my life and everything that's gone on in my life. There's nothing that I've got nothing to hide. I'm lucky to survive, but I survived. Some of the others didn't. I'm the, 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 the door that opens up everything. And to those men who abused you, you are their worst nightmare. Yes. They're, going to, they're going to be lying in bed at night, worried that Richard Kerr's evidence is going to catch up with them. They're going to get a knock on the door. Sadly, we'll probably never know just how many innocent children became victims of the pedophile gang operating at the highest reaches of the British establishment. Certainly, we know of dozens, if not hundreds, of state wards who were trafficked from institutions to be used as playthings of the rich and powerful. But others were literally picked out and abducted off the streets of London, including the teenage son of the chauffeur to the Australian High Commissioner. One of the great mysteries is a case now being re-investigated by British police the disappearance and almost certainly the murder of a 15-year-old boy named Martin Allen. You smell a cover-up protecting the toffs, don't you? I smell rats of the highest order. Kevin Allen is Martin's brother. At the time Martin went missing, their father Tom was personal chauffeur to the Australian High Commissioner. So this is the car that your dad drove, yeah. with the number plate OZ1. Yeah, AUS1. One of the perks of their dad's job was a big house here in posh Kensington, right next to the High Commissioner's own residence. What a beautiful idyllic place for a young lad to grow up. Yeah, this is where we lived. But that happy life was about to be shattered. It's the 5th of November, 1979. 15-year-old Martin is heading home from school. A witness tells police he sees Martin being led onto a train by a tall, blonde man in his 30s. He's holding Martin by the scruff of his neck, and the boy is clearly distressed. They only go one stop. They get off here at Earl's Court. And as they're heading out through the station, 
the man is overheard to say to Martin, don't try to run. The only problem is that witness only comes forward weeks later when he sees the boy's face on the TV news. And of course, by that time, it's too late. The trail's cold and young Martin is never seen again. In the 36 years since your brother disappeared, has there ever been any leads, any information? No. Has his body ever been found? No. No, it's like he, he was abducted by aliens. The police investigation into Martin's disappearance was at best inept. One conversation with the officer in charge has stuck with Kevin. I, I just said to him that I think he's been taken by someone high up in, I don't know, establishment, whether it's a businessman or an official of some sort. And what did that senior policeman say to you? He said to me, you keep saying things like that, you could get hurt. That and sounds my, like a threat. Well, I was like, almost fell off my chair at 17. But my mum and my dad and me, that was it. It was over with the police. Now, police have reopened the case, also acknowledging they have credible evidence of murders committed by the Westminster pedophile ring. These are children. These were children at the time, and they were abused because they were children, because he could get away with it. Former policemen, too, like Kelvin Ashby, are now revealing the extent of the cover-up how their own investigations of politicians and government officials were stopped in their tracks on orders from above. My immediate boss told me that the, the decision had been made higher up the chain. Ashby was a detective inspector when he began investigating allegations that a prominent Labour MP, Greville Jenner, now a lord, was sexually abusing a 12-year-old boy taken from a local children's home. Did you want to arrest Jenna? Yes, definitely. Were you stopped from arresting Jenna? Yes. What was it about the boy's story that made you think it was credible? Well, basically, he said that uh, he'd been collected from the children's home many, many times. By Jenna? By Jenna, in his car. And uh, that was... We, we backed that up. Lord Jenna, who has denied all the allegations, has not yet been charged, but the Crown Prosecution Service has admitted it had enough evidence to prosecute Jenna all along for the sexual abuse of at least nine children. But it may be too late. The very busy Baron Jenna of Braunstone now claims to be suffering from dementia. And yet he's voted in the House of Lords on 203 occasions since he was diagnosed. Yeah, and, and, and again, it's dual, dual standards, isn't it? So if he's good enough to vote, he's good enough to stand trial? Yeah, it still sticks in the craw. I was about to say, it still matters to you. Oh, oh absolutely, it? yeah, yeah. What's been going through your head? Uh, what might have been, basically, for these kids' sake. Have you ever met this man? We asked Richard Kerr to identify his abusers from photographs. What about this man? Yes. OK, he's a former member of parliament. Yeah, I know. I mean, everybody, yes. In Manchester. Cyril Smith, or Smithy. Cyril Smith was a prominent member of parliament whose sexual abuse of children over a period of decades was so rampant that the Crown Prosecution Service has now formally admitted it was negligent in failing to prosecute him. Richard Kerr knew him intimately. He's got a scar down there. Did he rape you? He didn't rape, we just had oral sex. He, he oral sexed me. He was a notorious pedophile. Wasn't he? He was a hateful and snake. This man was a snake in the grass. Coming up, from politicians to spies. Do you know this man? 
I know this man. Striking at the heart of MI6. He's the one who carried the Brian book. Confronting a member of the secret pedophile ring. If they were traumatized, they wouldn't have gone along. You see, that, that's another lie that pedophiles spin. I don't think we should talk in this emotive fashion. <laughs> that's next on 60 Minutes. If anyone in Westminster's halls of power might have been tempted to turn a blind eye, it would be Zach Goldsmith, a Conservative MP from an upper crust establishment background. But it was Goldsmith who led the charge for a full judicial inquiry into the allegations. When I first was approached by people five, six years ago, and my initial instinct was to dismiss this stuff as madness, as conspiracy wackos, I know that many of the things that I would have been inclined to dismiss five, six years ago have since turned out to be true. What sort of things were people saying to you when they rang your electorate office and told you that they'd been abused? The, these were people who themselves had allegedly experienced very serious abuse, including rape. Um, these were children in the, well, they were children who were associated with a care home in my constituency, which was effectively mined by this paedophile ring, people taken to a guest house nearby, also in my constituency. Part of your call was to investigate why, time and time again, allegations, very serious allegations of sexual abuse of children yeah. were ignored. Mm. Is it a conspiracy or is it a stuff up? I would love to believe that it was a stuff up, but there were just too many of them. Key evidence not being picked up, key trails not being followed, key questions not being answered, bungled police operations and investigations stopping suspiciously. And I, I don't believe that you can explain all of those as stuff ups. I think there has to be an element of cover up or conspiracy, call it what you want. You've got this group of rich, powerful toffs who are basically raping, abusing and possibly even murdering poor, underprivileged young children. These are people who are at the bottom of society's ladder um, and therefore they had nowhere to go. And as a consequence of the abuse, their lives fell apart. So they became people whose evidence would never be credible in a court of law. Tell me what happened in the forest. How many people were participating in these abusive ceremonies? Yeah, there would be about seven or eight men each time. On occasion, there were police there. Police? Yeah, sometimes in uniform, but mainly, mainly not. Did any of the children ever run away? Yeah, I did. I tried. What happened? There was a, a police officer there and he caught up with me and carried me back. Well, you can understand, Esther. I mean, to me, this sounds incredible. <laughs> a police officer, a person trusted to enforce the law, forcibly dragging a little girl back to be sexually abused? There's a lot I don't understand about why they would do that. Um, I think it's all about power. You know, they... They got pleasure from, from proving that they could do what they want, when they want, and, and people couldn't do anything about that. Were there any people that you've now been able to identify? Yeah, I've now named um, two. Um, obviously, I didn't, at the time, I didn't know who they were and, and, and what they did. You know, I, I had my own names. What were your names? One guy was the piano man and the other guy was the Lord. So why did you call the piano man the piano man? Because it was one of his um, interests, I suppose. He'd, he'd like to watch me play the piano a lot. I am Mr Baker. I am age 11 and I'm going to play for you Allegro Uni. And why did you call the other man the Lord? Because I thought he was God. I'd heard the word Lord 
when other people sort of referred to him. What did he do to you? With him, it was it was everything. It, it went to full rapes. I wasn't a person. I was a. I was an object. I I, I feel dreadful asking you these questions, but he's, you're talking about penetrative sexual intercourse as a young girl. Yeah. What has this done to you emotionally? I mean, you obviously bottled up for so long. It's, it's been really hard. Um, for quite a lot of those years, I've been I've been really quite ill. Um, I drank a lot. I I thought that that would would dull the memories. Did it? No. I've got memories of the rapes. Um, seeing seeing those those men's faces above me. I think the worst. Um, The worst is with the with the nightmares, because in those I'm I'm always trying to get away and I and I can't. Why do you feel so strongly that you need to tell your story? You know, I, I was quiet for so long, and that damaged me so much being quiet. And I think other people need to to be aware that by by speaking out, it it you do start to get a sense of freedom.